If you will, turn back in your books to page 234. We're going to pick up around line 146 on page 234. From there we sailed on, glad to escape our death, yet sick at heart for the dear companions we had lost. We reached the Aenean island next, the home of Circe, the nymph with lovely braids and awesome power too, who can speak with human voice the true sister of murderous-minded Aetes. Both were bred by the sun who lights our lives. Their mother was Perse, a child the ocean bore. We brought our ship to port without a sound as a god eased her into a harbor, safe and snug, and for two days and for two nights we lay there, we lay by there, eating our hearts out, bent with pain and bone tired. When dawn with her lovely locks brought on the third day, at last I took my spear and my sharp sword again, rushed up from the ship to find a lookout point, hoping to glimpse some sign of human labor, catch some human voices. I scaled a commanding crag and, scanning hard, I could just make out some smoke from Circe's halls, drifting up from the broad terrain through brush and woods. Mulling it over, I thought I'd scout the ground, that fire aglow in the smoke, I saw it true. But soon enough this seemed the better plan. I'd go back to the shore and the swift ship first, feed the men, then send them out for scouting. I was well on my way down, nearing our ship, when a god took pity on me, wandering all alone. He sent me a big stag with high branching antlers right across my path. The sun's heat forced him down through his forest range to drink at the river's banks, just bounding out of the timber when I hit him square in the backbone, halfway down the spine, and my bronze spear went punching clean through. He dropped in the dust, groaning, gasping out his breath. Treading on him, I wrenched my bronze spear from the wound, left it there on the ground, and snapping off some twigs and creepers, twisted a rope about a fathom long. I braided it tight, hand over hand, then lashed the four hawks of that magnificent beast. Loaded round my neck, I lugged him toward the ship, trudging, propped up propped on my spear, no way to sling him over a shoulder, steadying him with one free arm. The kill was so immense. I flung him down by the hull and roused the men, going up to them all with a word to lift their spirits. Listen to me, my comrades, brothers in hardship. We won't go down to the house of death, not yet. Not until our day ar arrives. Up with you, look. There's still some meat and drink in our good ship. Put our minds on food. Why die of hunger here? My hearty urging brought them round at once. Heads came up from cloaks, and there by the barren sea they gazed at the stag, their eyes wide, my noble trophy. But once they'd looked their fill and warmed their hearts, they washed their hands and prepared a splendid meal. Now all day long till the sun went down we sat and feasted on sides of meat and seasoned wine. Then when the sun had set and night came on, we lay down and slept at the water's shelving edge. When young Dawn, with her rose-red fingers, shone once more, I called a muster quickly, informing all the crew. Listen to me, my comrades, brothers in hardship. We can't tell east from west, the dawn from dusk. Nor where the wind lights our lives goes under earth, nor where it rises. We must think of a plan at once, some cunning stroke. I doubt there's one still left. I scaled a commanding crag and from that height surveyed an entire island, ringed like a crown by endless waste of sea. But the land itself lies low, and I did see smoke drifting up from its heart through thick brush and woods. My message broke their spirit as they recalled the gruesome work of the Lystragonian King Antiphates and the hardy cannibal Cyclops thirsting for our blood. They burst into cries, wailing, streaming live tears that gained us nothing. What good can come of grief? And so, numbering off my band of men-at-arms into two platoons, I assigned them each a leader. I took one, and Lord Eurylochus took the other. We quickly shook lots in a bronze helmet. The lot of brave Eurylochus leapt out first, so he moved off with his two and twenty comrades, weeping, leaving us behind in tears as well. Deep in the wooden glens they came on Circe's palace, built of dressed stone on a cleared rise of land. Mountain wolves and lions roamed 
were roaming round the grounds. She'd bewitched them herself. She gave them magic drugs. But they wouldn't attack my men. They just came pawing up around them, fawning, swishing their long tails, eager as hounds that fawn around their master, coming home from a feast, who always backs, brings back scraps to calm them down. So they came nuzzling round my men, lions, wolves with powerful, big powerful claws, and the men cringed in fear at the sight of those strange, ferocious beasts. But still they paused at her doors, the nymph with lovely braid, Circe, and deep inside they heard her singing, lifting her spellbinding voice as she glided back and forth at her great immortal loom, her enchanting web a shimmering glory only goddesses can weave. Polites, captain of armies, took command, the closest, most devoted man I had. Friends, there's someone inside, playing, plying a great loom, and how she sings, enthralling. The whole house is echoing to her song. Goddess or woman, let's call out to her now. We're going to pause here and answer another question. <laughs> 